The Su-25, a Soviet jet-powered CAS aircraft, was developed for roughly the same reasons as the American A-10 Thunderbolt II. After World War II, both superpowers came to the conclusion that there was no need for a dedicated ground attack anymore. After the harsh lessons of the Vietnam War, though, the U.S. immediately revised their policy and started working on a new jet-powered attack aircraft. The Soviet top brass weren't as quick on the uptake, and that's why the aircraft that we now know as the Su-25 was initially developed basically as an unofficial passion project. There were no technical specifications, no contract, and no money. Even more than that, at the very beginning, engineers Ivanov and Samoilovich looked into the possibility of making such an aircraft without even notifying the chief designer of their bureau, Pavel Suhoy. When he learned about the project, though, he immediately offered his support. But the military decision makers proved to be much harder to impress. Some of them didn't really know what they wanted. Others wanted something completely different from what the engineers had to offer. Some officials were dreaming about a new fighter bomber like the Su-17, or a new ground attack aircraft like the MiG-27. Others envisioned a multi-seater design with defensive turrets, like the Il-28. Naturally, the development process was fraught with difficulties. Even at the early stage of developing the first operational prototype, the project was hampered by heated debates and fierce competition. In the end, engineers at the Suhoi OKB decided not to follow in the footsteps of their American counterparts. As far as similarities go, the A-10 and the Su-25 were both designed to play a similar role and were both subsonic, but that was about it. Unlike the A-10, the Soviet attacker wasn't designed around a specific gun. Instead, engineers built it around the idea of being able to carry as many bombs and missiles as possible. Other key features included excellent maneuverability at a range of different speeds and superior survivability. Thankfully, Soviet engineers had a lot of experience in all of those aspects. The team at Suhoi were already working on their first operational prototype when the project was finally recognized on the official level. On the 22nd of February 1975, Vladimir Ilyushin, the chief test pilot for the Sukhoi OKB, took the prototype to the skies for the very first time. And it didn't take long after that for the first production attackers to be used in the skies of Afghanistan. The Soviet air forces were pretty happy with the Su-25, as it quickly proved to be superior to the Su-17, the MiG-27, and the Yak-38. First, the new ground attack aircraft could be used from improvised or barely prepared airfields. Second, it had excellent subsonic maneuverability, allowing it to hit small or hard to reach targets with precision. Third, it could take a lot of punishment. The plane could shrug off machine gun fire with relative ease, and even stingers were not always successful in striking it down. Engineers kept improving and upgrading the Su-25, but that wasn't enough. To keep up with the times, it had to be modified to carry smart munitions like guided bombs and laser-guided anti-tank missiles. Another big thing was to give it all-weather capability, allowing it to operate both day and night, and equip it with more advanced navigation tools. To achieve that, the Soviets had to install a lot of new avionics systems, most notably a new multi-function radar. Some of those goals were achieved in the mid-1980s, when the USSR introduced a new variant of the Su-25, the Su-25T. Engineers converted a two-seater variant back into a one-seater, filling the extra space with equipment required for smart bombs and missiles. The aircraft had the same recognizable profile but became an almost perfect, high-precision weapon against armored targets on the ground. The USSR, though, didn't get to use it as its first combat operations happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the world didn't end with the dissolution of the Soviet Empire. And the way the few Su-25T aircraft built in the last years of the USSR were used suggested several possible directions for the future of the series. 
First of all, the aircraft of the Su-25 family were highly sought after abroad. The sturdy and effective Garach, also known as Frogfoot and named Rastjoska or Comb by its pilots, caught the interest of the military all around the world, from the Middle East to South America. Even though ultimately there weren't that many buyers for a very niche aircraft, there was enough interest to warrant the development of the new Su-25TM variant that took to the skies in 1995. It was modified to support an even wider range of air-to-ground weaponry, including new tools to use against fast-moving and small targets. But the biggest new change was that the Su-25TM could carry the Kapyo-25 radar in an under-fuselage container, facilitating the use of long-range air-to-surface missiles. The export version of the Su-25TM was designated Su-39. Right now, it's the most advanced and fearsome model in the whole series. The aircraft of the Su-25 series remain in active service in the real world, but you can also test their capabilities in War Thunder. There are both researchable and premium variants of this attacker waiting for you at the very top of the Soviet tech tree. And yes, that even includes the Su-39. What do you think about these flying tank destroyers? Tell us in the comments below.